it's like this steady it's like feeling wrapped and bathed in this loving energy doesn't mean i don't have occasionally a bad day you know or something because that's what can happen right like i get something in my head that I, i'm a little now off center but if when i relax and at night every time i feel him like when i roll over to the side of the bed i immediately feel his energy and i hear him say okay now we're together and and i and i immediately there have been times when i roll over that side of the bed i immediately feel like turned on i go okay i know you're in the mood tonight like okay and i'm not thinking of that you know i'm just like literally rolling over to that side of the bed and to yeah. me that's evidence that he's there yeah but more than feeling like turned on you know there's this love that's just so hard to explain to people who haven't experienced this and i've had people again that i work with that say you know what as much as i grieve the loss of my my partner i must admit like i have access to him like all the time now when he used to work all the time and he wasn't around and now i feel him with me i can talk to him i i feel loved this is amazing. Yes, it's so sad that he's not physically here, but you know what? In some ways this is better because I'm never alone. Yeah, exactly. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fat, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. Always a blessing to present another show for you all. Well, today we are going across the veil to the other side of existence. I don't even like to do it. We're going to up the frequency, let me put it this way, <laughs> talk about and talk about the afterlife with the beautiful Pamela Johnson. Welcome to the show, Pamela. Oh, thank you for having me. So happy to be here. And um, Pam's got a beautiful story to share about her relationship with her husband, as uh, as it after he transitioned, let me let me read you what she what she's got to say. So on the sixth of August two thousand and twenty, during the early days of COVID, Pam's husband Alan crossed over from an injury related to dementia. The day after he passed, Alan returned to Pam to tell her three things: one, that they were twin souls who had a soul contract to continue their relationship across the veil, and two that they would work side by side, healing and teaching people their primary mission to teach people how to continue relationships with their partners and loved ones who have transitioned. And three, and most importantly, Alan vowed to love, cherish and, and support Pam and to be the loving husband he said he failed to be during their earthly marriage, even asking her to marry him again so that they could have a second chance at love. Alan also said that they would write a book together, even giving her the title Supernatural Love, A True Story of Life and Love After Death. Pamela Johnson is an inspirational speaker, author, spiritual healer and founder of the Supernatural Love Academy. She's had 35 years of experience as a professional channeler and spiritual mentor. And your website, Pam, is supernaturallove.com, right? Yes, correct. I was reading, I was telling Pam, I was reading some of her Facebook. I was checking around on Facebook today. <laughs> Me, curious mind. And I'm like, when did he die? How old was he? How long ago was it? What was oh, she yeah. writing on her Facebook? I was thinking, and I've, I just took this off. Uh, I saw the post where you informed people that he had left. Alan passed away tonight at around 8 p.m. It's so like him to have chosen his birthday to make his exit. On the morning of his birthday, I said to him, you better not be planning on dying on your birthday. <laughs> and you say, I can hear him laughing in heaven. <laughs> yep. So he was 83, so he'd had a good run. He turned 83, yes. And he didn't look his age. I mean, he looked like 20 years younger. He didn't. I was he, thinking that. I'm like, he doesn't look 83. Anyway, tell us the story. How did it all unfold? 
Well, gosh, where do you want to start? Alan was, he was larger than life person, um, literally when I met him, like a lot of people do when they meet their soulmate twin flame, they just recognize right away. And as soon as I gave him a hug, I, I literally felt this bolt of electricity come through me. And I, I never felt that before. I thought this can't be real. You know, this is like a movie. And I was confused. And within two days, he said he knew he was in love with me. I didn't, I wasn't sure about that. I just knew there was a connection, but he said two days later. But anyway, we got together. It was, it's a long step part of is a long story. It's all in our book, but um but basically what started out as, as this incredible relationship, like many do, you know, ours, in our case, we just hit some pitfalls. Like there was some problems because his ego got in the way and he wanted to be this world-class psychic. He was traveling the world doing readings and didn't want to want to be married, didn't want to have another child because I got pregnant and that was not what he wanted. And so we kind of started to drift apart and our marriage was essentially comfortable. We got along really well. We, I knew he loved me. He wasn't sure about me for other reasons, his insecurity, but that was why the relationship wasn't as fulfilling for both of us, just because his ego was kind of butting heads with, you know, my, my need for, for more, for more involvement with me and our, our child and, and I think that story is played out in a lot of relationships, you know, where career needs clash with personal family needs, relationship needs, right? And, and so when he crossed over, he realized that he really blew it. He thought he'd done a good job. <laughs> I, I, in the book, it even says that he he came through and he says, I thought like I did good. And the, uh oh, he kind of got this, uh oh. <laughs> and then with the life review, he realized, oh no, uh -huh. because he could feel what I felt, right? You know how that is with the yeah. life review. He saw everything and he was so devastated. He just, he was just so upset, but then he realized, he found out that we were meant to continue and he was really excited about that. And he realized that it was supposed to be this way, that yeah. he was supposed to leave when he left and he was supposed to connect with me from your side and, and love me in this way. And so as I detail in the book, you know, our relationship was challenged for a very good reason, because otherwise we wouldn't have anything to teach. You know, if we had this perfect right. idyllic relationship mm -hmm. that had no problems at all, like what's there to teach anybody, right? They'll just say, good for you, <laughs> but what not, I can't relate to that. And when I started telling my story, people were coming to me saying, I can so relate to you. And I thought, really? We're two psychics, you know, we're healers and you can relate to us. They go, oh yeah, I can relate to what you went through with Alan. I can relate to the challenges you had. I relate to both of you. And so I saw why we had to go through that, you know, and I think that is the same for a lot of people. We have to look at our life and say, there's a reason why I'm having these challenges. If there's a reason why I have to go through these things, you know, it's, it's something that I set up in advance. And I have free will, how I walk through it, what I do with it. But I certainly set that in motion. You know, I mean, I knew I loved him. He knew he loved me, but it was like we were butting heads sometimes. And yet we got along. That was, that was the amazing thing. I knew he was the only one for me, but I wasn't completely happy, but it was good enough that I wouldn't leave. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, and he would never leave either. So and again, I think a lot of couples can relate to that too, that I know this person is the one, even though I'm struggling here, I know there's nobody else is going to take their place, but we have to look at why am I here then? You know, why am I, why am I in this relationship if I'm having these struggles and I know this person is the one for me? So I've even had people tell me who have not lost a loved one say that it's helped them understand their own relationship right now. Like I need to appreciate who I'm with now and look at why, why are we having the problems we're having? You know, what can we do about that? Because life is short in the physical world, eternal in the other side, but short here, right? So are we making the most of it? Are, are we being complacent? Just knowing this person loves us and just taking that for granted and going off on a merry way, you know, doing other things and not paying attention to the ones we love the most and appreciating that and really relishing the time 
we have with them. I think a lot of people aren't. You just get caught up with all the distractions in the 3D world. And when they're when you cross over, you realize, oh my God, all it's about is love. <laughs> That's the only thing that matters. Why was I chasing all this other stuff? Why was I doing all these other things and not really giving and receiving love as fully as I could? So when Alan came back, the first thing I felt was this blast of love, literally like, and I'd be going, what the heck is this? You know, because I would be grieving and then feel this love come in. And I, I, I felt like I was going a little nuts, you know, but I knew it wasn't me because I wasn't trying to conjure this love coming at me, but I could feel it. And he'd say, you just need to cry. If you cry, you make room for the love. Just, just cry when you need to cry, let it all out. The more you cry, the more you'll be able to feel my love. And I noticed that was true because I would cry, 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 as you know, if you're grieving. And then I'd, there'd be this space and I'd feel him come in and, and it was just incredible. But it's such a seesaw journey. And I tell people that, you know, I work with that to prepare for that because it's very much a high one moment and then a low another moment. But eventually it does even out because in my case, the grief was pretty much gone in about nine months. But the journey through that, I had to, I got really angry. <laughs> I didn't realize how pissed off I'd been for like 30 years we were together. And I remember two days walking around the house, just yelling at him, just cursing at him, which is so unlike like me. And on the other side, I knew because my friends were mediums, they said, oh my God, he's like, oh my God, I've never seen her this angry before. But he knew that, okay, she has to get it out. She mm -hmm. has to get it out of her system. And so I was cursing him. And, and that, of course, it, it ended because I realized, okay, that's all I can do. <laughs> like, I'm mad. You took it. He said, he said, I, I get it. I failed you. And you know, there was a reason for it. And I said, I know, but doesn't change the fact that I'm upset, right? So he knew that even though there was a higher purpose for our challenges, it's still important that the other party says, I'm sorry, I love you, please forgive me. Even though we planned it, I, I'm sorry you were hurt. And so we went through a period of really navigating that because just when you think like you completely healed it or cleared it, it's like more comes up. You know how that is with emotional processing, right? You, you clear what you can. And then if there's more, it comes up, it keeps coming up. So it did that for a while. And now it's completely like handled handled. There's no more regret. There's no, you know, resentment. There's no looking back and thinking what might've been, because that's what a lot of us do. And, and I'm at peace with that. And, and actually really excited about what we're experiencing now. And I think that's one thing I would tell people who have lost someone is that once you understand that you can still continue to connect with them, realize you can build new memories in the now, but you're not there yet. So you look at the past and think, well, that's gone. You know, I don't have them anymore, but you feel sad because they're not in the physical, but you haven't built the new memories. So you need time for that. And they're going to be with you in a different way, but they really can be with you. And as I was telling you before we got on here, I mean, I'm hearing from people that I'm meeting through my Facebook group, soulmates in the afterlife is my Facebook group. They come in and I connect with them. And some people tell me the most amazing stories of connecting with their, this is mostly partners, with their partners who've crossed over that were totally shocking to them that they'd have physical contact. And I don't mean just after they pass because that's, that's really normal that there is contact because they still have this residual earth energy, you know, to kind of manifest and, and come through and move things and all that. But, um, but this is going on like continuously for some people. And Alan says to me that it's because the other side's going stronger and, and con they want contact. He says they've always wanted contact. And, and a lot of people have always had contact. We just don't hear about them because a lot of people think that if they talk about it, you know, people are gonna think they're crazy, right? So they're not gonna openly say, oh yeah, I talk to my husband every night. You know, we have dinner every night or, or and I talk to him all through the day. And, and they're not gonna say that, but I'm hearing them tell me that because that's what's happening to me, right? So 
I think that this phenomenon is really growing. I think that, because uh, I, I keep hearing from people, and I think as people feel more comfortable expressing it, that we'll hear more of it. And to me, I think it will become at some point as common as the stories we hear from people having near-death experiences, because that's really accepted right now, right? Whereas initially it wasn't so much in the beginning days, but now it's like, it seems like, I'm not trying to make light of it, but it seems like everybody's had an NDE. <laughs> I, I had one too, but I mean, it just seems like, you know, uh, because the way medical, the medical field is, you know, people are being brought back from the brink of death. So more of that, they're saying that's why more of it's happening yeah. because they're able to save people, right? So anyway, I just think at some point it's going to be really much more common, but that we're at a, kind of a, the brink of it because it hasn't really gone, gone out there. People are writing books um, like mine, I know, and it's great to, to get the, their stories out there that they're having the contact. But our book is really, uh, really personal. It's really um, <clears throat> like uh, not, not trying to really teach per se. And yet a lot of people are learning from reading our story, but it's all like what happened and the messages he gave me and the messages he gave to other people to give to me and how we had to navigate this kind of emotional minefield of how he hurt me. And then he was afraid to hurt me again, you know, now that he was crossed over because he still had guilt and he still had some of his personality was getting in the way because he still had a bit more ego. It was really fascinating because I didn't even understand like, well, I thought you dropped the ego. And I realized, no, he hung on to more of it than he should have to have a relationship with me. And so he was really like afraid to just tell me what he wanted to tell me. So I had to get other people to bring through his message of why he had been so kind of detached from me in our marriage because I never understood that like why did you change like I, I could never understand it and he couldn't tell me himself and I was ready to just like walk away from the whole relationship or say this is too crazy you know you're not in the body and on top of that I don't even know why you you know did the things you did and he finally had to get somebody to tell me so that that started to really heal everything and change. But um, that's kind of the not so short <laughs> uh, summary of the story. There's a lot more in the book. Um, I mean, to give you an idea of how personal, you know, the book is the first the first chapter, which is what he told me we'd write about in the title he gave me was was is called Why Don't You Sleep Naked? <laughs> and I said, <laughs> what? And don't worry, it's not an R-rated book. It's not <laughs> like it's that, you know, that, that nitty gritty, but it, it's just shows you that I'm, I was writing everything he said, we're going to share this, we're going to tell it all, because if you make it just all pretty and perfect, no one's going to believe it. It's too, you just have to tell the truth. And so I just put it all out there because that's how he always was. And that's all, you know, I've always been. So so it's all there, and um, we launched it on February, came out February 14th, Valentine's Day, and had amazing um, response from people that read it. So we're, we're going to like do another free ebook giveaway every three months. So we're about to do one again. And as far as I'm concerned, if I could, I would give away the book all the time, but I can't do that. Amazon only lets you do that like every three months, as you may know. So, but if I had it left up to me, I just want people to read this and know that it's possible to continue their relationship. And, and also that I think that this journey is actually a powerful, powerful way of spiritually awakening because our loved ones in the spirit world, they love us unconditionally. And if we can open to love ourselves unconditionally, then we can go through this transformation similar to what they went through, you know, because I think that's, that's really the challenge is a lot of us are still struggling to do that, you know, because being in a body with an ego, it's not easy. You're dealing with that, you know, but to understand that, all right, I'm a soul. I'm, I am love. I'm born from love, created from love. I'll return to love and having that connection with someone through the veil who really loves you that way. Cause most people in a body, no matter how much they care, you have an ego really hard to love unconditionally. 
as I'm sure you know. So we have, you know, that opportunity to really heal ourselves and open up to love ourselves and others. And I think that's a powerful, powerful gift they give us from the other side. So absolutely. Well, you've said a few things here that I want to talk about. I love that you said that they return to love, which was the name of my first book. When I asked my guides, what am, what will I write about? They said, write about what you know. And I said, well, I know about death because <laughs> so many of people I loved had died, starting with mum when I was a kid. And, um, yeah, return to love. The message, though, is exactly what you say, Pam. The message is we don't have to die to return to love. We can return to love while we're still here. And when we do, yeah. we've got access to that side. That is love, right? Right, so, right. I wanted to ask you, so he was a working psychic. I didn't know yeah. that about him. I actually don't know much about your story, so I'm going to find out with the listeners. Uh, as I say, I was looking a bit on your Facebook this That's morning. <laughs> and um, he was he a working psychic before yes. you met him? Yes, I met him because he was traveling. Uh, he had been traveling to Hong Kong for a few years. From He was from the England traveling to Hong Kong to do readings because they have a strong, you know, expat community, right, of Britishers. And so we'd go to a new age shop there in Hong Kong and do readings. And they'd be going, I don't know, so many times a year with a friend of his who was a very well-known medium in the UK. And so they came to Hawaii because their UK, their Hong Kong um, trip was kind of canceled. I think there was some sort of miscommunication. So, so it fell through. So they weren't able to go to Hong Kong as planned, but they were supposed to go to Nebraska after Hong Kong. And so now they had this big gap in their itinerary and they had a contact in Honolulu that, and, and so his friend Barbara said, well, why don't we go to Hawaii? And Alan said, I don't want to go. <laughs> and, and she said, what? who doesn't want to go to Hawaii, you know, like, what are you talking about? Right. I don't know. I, I don't have a good feeling about it. <laughs> I, don't, oh, wow. I don't want to go to Hawaii. Well, it turns out later he realized that he was sensing that his whole life was going to change and he doesn't like change. He never liked change. So he was like resisting it. You know, he was really yeah. like not sure about it. So, but they end up coming. They came, he walked into the new age story that I was working in at the time, at that time. And my, uh, the, my friend, the owner of the store went, turned to me when they asked if, if they knew anybody, if they could find any place else for them to stay, if they knew anybody. And my friend said, you can stay with Pam. <laughs> and I heard myself say yes. And I thought, why did I say yes? I don't even know these people, you know? And that's how it all started. Cause he was traveling to doing reading. And he still did that. Even after we got together, he did that for another five or six years. He kept traveling to us. He, he'd been to Australia a few times and been to, um, yeah, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, and not so much the U S but, but over there. And he was a, he was with the, with BAPS, that's a British astrological and psychic society. So he was a cert, he was certified with them. That was before I met him. So yeah, he was in this field before I met him. He probably got involved in it just a year or two before I became really interested in this and opened as a channel and started doing readings with people. So we kind of opened up at the same time, oh. just me in Hawaii and him in the UK. But he had been a successful businessman prior to that and had run companies of his own. So he had a very different kind of a background from a lot of psychics, right? He had a very strong uh, business sense, uh, entrepreneurial sense, and then he went into being a medium. But, it, but a psychic had predicted that he was going to do that. And he looked at her like he, she was crazy, like, what are you talking about? She says, you're a natural medium. And it turns out he was, because he would feel spirit when he was little. And he didn't know what that was. And he was getting guidance all along as an adult. He thought he was just lucky. <laughs> he would get these like impulses, right? And he'd go do it and go, oh, see, I'm just lucky. And then realize later, wait a minute, I'm, I'm just psychic. I'm just following <laughs> my intuition. Yeah. And, and luck had nothing to do with it. He made his own luck. So yeah, he was a professional psychic. Not so comfortable with mediumship. And I talk about that a lot with our, our students and clients. And I'm not putting down mediumship. I'm just saying that he wasn't comfortable personally with it because he didn't want to get 
into his emotions. And he always questioned like, how do you know you're really talking to the dead and not just reading the person? Cause he knew that he could just read the soul on the other side. So he says, how do I know I'm really talking to them? And, I th- and he was always asking spiritual teachers that he met over the years or together and nobody gave him a good answer, even people that were professional mediums. So he said, <laughs> oh, well, oh, well. And when he came back to me, he said, he had me look on YouTube and f- I found a medium who actually answered that question. It was so funny. He goes, watch this video. You'll see what I mean. And this medium, I can't remember her name now. She actually, she actually explained that. Somebody asked that question in this interview. How do you know you're really talking to the dead and not reading the person? And she said, it's actually, it takes a lot of training to, to know the difference because she said, yes, you could just read their energy, but, but talking to them is different. So he said, see, <laughs> see, I told you it's different. He didn't trust himself to be able to do that all the time consistently. So he'd rather to be a psychic that he could nail like that. It could be phenomenal as a psychic. So he, he was just not unsure about really diving into mediumship for that reason. Cause he wanted to know that he was in control of the reading. And of course the mediumship, you can't control if they're going to come through. So he didn't like that part. So that was just his, his issue. Yeah, it was really, it was really interesting. There's a lot to say about all that. Um, because there's so many levels that a person can pick up on. Yeah, yeah, right, and, right. And, and different people have different intentions exactly. and different um, exactly. agreements about what they'll do and what they'll teach. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's that show called The Mentalist and he says, right. I'm not psychic, I'm just very observant. And I think to myself, what do you think psychic ability yeah, is? Yeah, exactly. It, of course, and you can't separate that. Yeah. He's being psychic right? without knowing that he's psychic, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> People yeah. do that all the time. Yeah, they exactly. think I'm not psychic. Like Alan, he said, oh, I'm just lucky. Oh, dude, you're just picking up on, you know, what's what's best for you, what your higher self is saying, come up this way. This is going to work out for you, right? Exactly. People yeah. just don't know that. So, yeah. And so, so your uh, interpretation of being psychic and a medium, I suppose it's the same. Psychics is someone that can read you and read your aura and sort of yeah. look at or, timelines. Cause I never say like, like, I don't do, I see people's futures, but I never tell them because as a teacher of deliberate creation, I would prefer them to, to be in alignment with the future they want rather than me reading a future they're on. Cause that can change, right? There are probable futures out there that psychics can see. Well, yeah, I thought the, I think isn't some of the current thinking now, especially because of quantum physics, understanding that everything's happening now. So when you're doing a reading, you're reading now. And this just means right now, if nothing changes, then this could happen. But right now you could change that. <laughs> so that might not happen. Yeah. And so you're reading you know, a trajectory of the frequency. The right. Of how, how, how strong is that likelihood? If it's really strong, yeah, it could you- be 90%. I have to tell you this story because this happened in Hawaii. So uh, we were chatting before I put on the recording and my girlfriend's father owned an apartment in Hawaii. And when I was 19 or 18, I think, uh, a few of us went and stayed there. We went to a market and we had a palm reading at the market in Hawaii. Oh, International Marketplace, right? I don't remember. It was so long ago. In Waikiki, right? But in Waikiki, right? Yeah. Because that would be it. They, they They had the enchanted tree. That's what right. it was called, the enchanted tree, and oh, you had this to is read going, it. This is going way back. Anyway, no, it, so, it's been it was been around forever. It was probably so one of there my girlfriends like had a reading, and the person said, "You're going to die young, a violent death." And oh, God. Like, oh my God! Anyway, years later, 20, 40 years later, she says to me, "I don't believe in psychic uh, abilities." You know, when I told her that I, what I did, and um, and I said, "Why?" And she said, "Remember the market? They told me that, and it didn't happen." And I said to her you were going to die young a violent death at that time because she was into dating gangsters. Like she was oh my a goodness. 18, 19 year old kid who liked dating men in their fifties that were predominantly gangsters. Do you know what I mean? And one yeah. of her boyfriends who had an Italian restaurant in a, in an affluent shopping suburb was gunned down in the street 
like he was murdered in a drive-by shooting. And at that time, she was on that trajectory, right? And so the psychic saw that and also yeah. gave her a warning. And then she decided from that reading, I better, you know, stop dating these sort of men and look for a nice man and get married and have a couple of yeah. kids and move to the suburbs, which is exactly what she did. And so, right, so yeah. See, that, and, and see, the reason to get a reading is to see if you are on the road to manifesting something you don't want like that, right? Saying, well, I don't want that. <laughs> like, I don't want to that to happen. But thank goodness that she didn't take it seriously because other people, they're easily programmed, right? So they go, oh my God, I guess I'm going to die. And then they're going right. to make it happen. Right. So that's why getting readings is so tricky. Like, yeah. are you programming the person or are you letting them know, you know, can change this? Yeah, We're, I'm just telling you what is possible, but if you don't want it, you Which can change Which most psychics it. don't say that, you know, right. they, they do a reading and they don't say, but you can change this. Because I worked with a psychic when I first started radio about 13, 14 years ago, and she didn't do that. She would just tell it, things just or not it. tell it or not say that. One day I remember on radio, she said, oh, I didn't tell him his future because he's going to lose his house and he's going to lose everything. And I said, rather than telling him a future he doesn't want, help him change his frequency. Help right, him, right. Help him feel more positive because he was like all depressed and, you know, and in his complaint and in that frequency, he was heading for more for things that. to get depressed about and be complained about. But, right. um, and she sort of went, oh, and she completely shifted from calling herself a psychic to a teacher. But That's, some, yeah, because she's, you know, that, yeah. rather than just reading people, she could help them shift their frequency. That's, that's when I did my readings. That's what I preferred to do because I was always more of a teacher and I didn't want to just program them to say, well, this is what's going to happen when I knew that this doesn't have to happen. Like, you know, change your life, change your future. Right. So from the beginning, I was always doing that in my sessions, but Alan right. was more a pure psychic, although so he, he would tell them that they could change it. He was so good at seeing just everything around them, what was coming. And he had people coming to him like, for 30 years you know wanting so, uh like what's happening in my future because i know he, that he, he would do a more conventional reading yeah but then he would mm -hmm. also try to teach them in that you know how they could so he, he change didn't work, that. when you say he didn't work as a medium he didn't talk to people who had crossed over well he, is that what you call me he would have he would have this other side trying to get in uh -huh. like and he would be literally pushing them out because you know when they know somebody is a strong medium you know yeah. they really come banging on the door right yeah, yeah and he didn't want to so he was i could see him going like like just trying to like get them out of here you know but like, he didn't want to do mediumship he just didn't and and he and i think because he had this emotional block because of the challenges we were having in the relationship and he had shut down kind of dissociated so when you do mediumship you know you're going to get emotional because you're dealing with souls on their side hurt. They're very emotional. The person there is really emotional because they're trying to talk to their loved one, right? So he didn't want to go there. But yet spirit was like, come on, like, I know you can hear me. Like, I, and get me, give me this message. So, so he would just do a straight psychic reading because he knew I could, he could get it really accurate and do it successful and feel proud about that, right? So he didn't want to go there. <laughs> he didn't want to go there with the mediumship. And he, he's, he's he, laughing he, now because he just says, what was I doing? You know, that was. I know Alan's been buzzing around me since yesterday, actually. <laughs> I, I haven't really engaged him. Um, I haven't really engaged him. And then this morning, as I said, I was looking on your page. I felt him stronger and I thought he'll come through stronger when I'm talking to Pam. But um, you said something really interesting about him hanging on to his ego when he crossed yeah. over and you said, I thought a bit too much, ego. a bit too much. And you said he hung on to it too much, but it's interesting because I was telling you about Elisa Medhus and her son who crossed when he killed himself years ago. You know, he came through with his ego too. And uh, she said that she liked that because you said something, you hung on to the ego to attach to me while I'm still in the physical. Well, because well, what I, what I, what happened, what he said to me and what I've seen with other people that I work with who are having the similar relationship through the veil is that, you know, if they don't have their ego, at least some of it, they're, they're going to be what? They're going to be like angelic. They're going to be so like Zen, right? We'd go, who's this person? I don't know this person. And so, yeah, they have to keep some of their personality that's ego, a, that's right? Exactly, because we yeah. want the relationship with the human them. Yes. I mean, you, you and I know that we're everything. We're God. We're, 
we're angelic, we're everything. And there's a higher part of ourselves that is not bothered by anything and is very blissed out. We don't want, we want that human them, right? So Alan said, I, I want you to, you never got to have this full relationship with me. So I'm going to be me, Yeah, you know, with yeah. his personality and everything, but, but a lot gentler, you know, not strongly egotistical at all. I mean, very patient, which he never was. So many things were different, but yeah, he kept on, he said he hung on too much of the ego. And so he was so afraid of hurting me because of that, because it was the ego that's afraid, like, well, what I'm going to hurt her. I don't want to devastate her again. Uh, I don't want to you know, feel that I can feel because plus they're highly empathic when they cross over super empathic. So he didn't want to feel my pain again, that he might cause me from that. So he was so afraid that he was walking on eggshells and he wasn't always talk. He talked to me sometimes and he shut up and I'd go, what's going on? You know? Um, and, and it was really fascinating because other times he'd be talking to me, talking to me, and then he'd just be gone for two months. I said, what's happening? It was because he, he was afraid of saying the wrong thing and hurting me again, didn't want to do that. And yet it was hurting me. Trying not to hurt me was hurting me. So yeah, they, they kind of can hang on a bit too much. And recently I'll share this with you that just happened with my uh, an academy member we have these calls every week coaching calls and one person she was saying that her husband was really unhappy that he crossed over and and i don't know if you've ever heard of this i I'm, it's not i don't i don't not believe it i could feel i could believe it but but he really didn't want to leave this world but he did leave he's not earthbound and you know how some people can choose to stay and then they're earthbound. So luckily he did leave, but he's so unhappy that he's on the other side that he he's kind of like doesn't want to like open up to her because he just like is upset about it, like just upset about it. So she's been really frustrated that she can't connect with him, even though she knows he's there and she's been trying. And so where Alan said, OK, we're going to try to help him accept what's happened. But, you know, he, again, I think he hung on to a bit too much. Oh, Alan saying he was very attached to the earth plane and he really, really, really didn't want to die, really didn't want to, didn't like the idea of leaving. And, and so he's still hanging on. He's only been gone 10 months. So I don't think that that's, you know, a super long time, but he's just like there alone, like oh, another medium that I know who's, he's really good. He saw him like in the woods, like in nature, which is where everybody loved to be. And he's just there like, but he's not happy, you know? So Alan says, sometimes that's true. You know, people need time to process and their transition, they, they're, they have free will. So, but they're eventually he'll get there, but he's not there right now. And it's causing her some concern. So it's really interesting. I even the, my medium friend who did that, you know, reading, he, I think he was surprised too, but we were seeing a lot of interesting things <laughs> with, through the veil, who knows, right? Who knew? Like we yeah. have free will, we can do what we want. We cross over, nobody can make us. They can't make us leave if we want to be earthbound, you know, they can it's, talk. It's not, it's not the, it's not us that's earthbound. It's only the aspect which is still connected to that ego, like the ego personality is a creation unto itself. Yes. The yes. body has a consciousness. It's a creation. Right. Exactly. It's a creation that the soul is using to experience this realm, but it isn't right. the person. It's you're no. talking to the creation and not the person. Like right. you can talk to, I have a girlfriend who came over the other day. Her mom is transitioning. She's 98. She's very old. And um, she doesn't want to go. She keeps saying, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> She's very old. Anyway, and like we were talking about this, like we're talking about the soul versus when the soul is more in connection with the body and the ego, it is in that loving state. And she said that she's had moments with her mother where she says, I'm not going to be far. I'm going to be with your dad. I'll just be in, like in another room. I'll still, I'll prompt you from the other side. I'll prompt you. And she's having this conversation. The next day she's like, right. She's angry. She's frustrated. She doesn't want to go. So what's happening? One minute she's like enlightened. The next minute she's angry. And as I was shown, it's like the consciousness or the soul has stepped out of the body and is witnessing 
the mm-hmm, ego mm-hmm. run the mm-hmm. body without the the soul's connected but the soul is not enmeshed with the ego it's like the soul right. has just sort of stepped away so the ego is still talking and eating and complaining and frustrated and angry but it's it's like the soul or the consciousness of the soul so so the part that gets trapped or is angry is not the real person it's just the creation that the yeah so with he maybe hanging on to like we have a physical mind right that is connected to the physical body that is that ego right. and then there's a higher mind higher self but when we're here in a body both are needed to walk through this life and so but that physical mind yeah that's just the temporary construct but i think it's tricky if they're going to have these interdimensional relationships because they have to keep some of that or we won't recognize them, right? Like, who the heck are you? You know, you're too perfect. Like, I, I want my husband or I want my I know, wife. That, or, that's, you know. what, that's what Elisa said about her son. If, if a medium had said, oh, I've got your son here. And, she, and he's saying, hello, dear ones. I'm here to, <laughs> she's like, that's not know, my son. That, you know, exactly. Like, but exactly. Like, when she knew she was connected to a son through a medium called Jamie Butler, she said, I'm sorry, but this spirit is swearing his head off and I've never had a spirit swear like that. And Elisa's like, that's my son. <laughs> and so he's just swearing exactly. and, and exactly. it was hilarious and she could recognize him. And and he even from the other side said that he's going to keep his personality to teach as a spiritual teacher from the other side so that humans on earth can relate to him as opposed mm-hmm. to the hello well, that, you ones. Exactly. And that that's kind of what Alan says because right. he's come through to other people that we work with, you know, and he's come through friends I'm, I have who are mediums. They talk to him and, you know, he still has his sense of humor. A lot of people say he's so funny. I go, yep, that's his personality, but it's just toned down, you know, it's more balanced. It's not, but when he first came back, cause he still had a lot of remorse and, and guilt about the relationship that he hadn't fully processed himself. That's what, what the problem was. He'd hung on a little too much of that and he was able to still the fear right because that's really what the ego is fear so he was afraid to you know drop that and then he finally did then everything shifted but um that surprised me i i a lot of people just think that their loved ones cross over they must be perfect now well not perfect but you know like just just know everything maybe or or well, they don't yeah. they don't know it but they, they have these unrealistic expectations like n- no <laughs> yeah well i mean some are some aren't it just depends on the work that you do here on earth like we can dissolve or make the ego less dominant while we're right. physically incarnated and we can do that when we're we've crossed out you know we've moved out of the body so it depends on the work that you do but you have a better experience when you you don't dissolve the ego but you make it less dominant as a force right exactly in your yeah, life but not as... i want to ask you some questions about what happened so wh- when did he come through with those three things like we've had pretty were... much right away like, like within the first week mm-hmm. like the the feeling i call them love blasts were happening like the, the next day he was coming through and I'm strongly clear audience so I could hear him but like I said sometimes he was quiet you know and 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 so it was very confusing to me it wasn't like a steady thing so so I try to tell people I work with you know don't expect it to always be the same because who knows what they're going through and what are you going through you know your ability to perceive can be all over the place too so don't get upset like where'd he go like I'm not hearing him now and because that happened to me quite often so it was, um, it just kept getting stronger. And I was lucky that I had other, one good friend who could, can see him. She sees spirit and she could hear, talk to him. So she was helping me a lot, but actually very quickly, he told me, could you stop asking, asking Swati to, to talk to me for you and start listening to me yourself because, and really trusting what you hear, because otherwise you're never going to develop that more. <clears throat> and, and so I said, okay. And I just started to talk to him in my mind and just started to, you know, trust everything I heard and got more confirmation. But, but it was, it was pretty much like constant. Like he would wake me up in the morning, like about two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, you know, the, the, the hour when it, the veil is thinner and I, and I'd be writing, he'd want me to write. And I was writing what he wanted to say. And, and it went on and on. So I, he asked me to form a Facebook group. The first 
week after he passed, which I thought was really wild because he couldn't stand Facebook. Like he was really annoyed with Facebook. What what's these notifications they're sending me? Like he would get really because he was older, right? That's he's not he's not of that generation, and so he'd get really annoyed. And they said, "What you want me to form a Facebook group?" As you know, I was posting in my Facebook page, my personal page, about Alan's passing, and I said, "Okay, but." Why would I do that? He goes, because I want you to continue to share the story. I said, all right, what story? He goes, because I'm going to keep communicating with you and I want you to share it in the group, not on your personal page. So uh, within a week, I set up that page. I told all my friends on my personal page, hey, I'm, I have this group. If you want to continue you know, hearing about the story with Alan. And about 145 people or so jumped into that group, like immediately said, oh, I want to find, I want to find out what happens because a lot of my friends are clients of ours and his and as well as friends. So it just took off. And I just, I would write like usually two or three times a day, it would just be coming through and I'd be sharing what happened or what he wanted to say. And he, I think he liked having an audience because that was kind of his way. And he kept coming with that. And, and, and actually within that first week or maybe two weeks, he said, we're going to write a book. And I said, well, what would we write it about? He said, about what I'm going to share with you, about how I'm going to come through to you, how we're going to forge this relationship. I said, okay. And he gave me the title of the book <clears throat> that we have now. It never changed. He told me to buy the domain name, Supernatural Love. And I said, well, surely that can't be available. He said, it is. Go look don't believe me, go look. And it was, it was for sale. It wasn't cheap. It wasn't extraordinarily expensive, but it wasn't cheap. He says, buy it. That's your domain. Okay. And he just told me things to do, you know, like you do this, you write the book. Um, you have to publish it yourself. You're going to have to invest in it heavily. We cannot be through a publisher. I said, why? Because, because you need to be in control of everything. They're, they would tell you how to change in it. You can't do that. This is going to be a different kind of a story. And I said, okay, so, you know, all of it. I don't know if that answers your question or maybe too much, but yeah, it was pretty like, like nonstop. Like I didn't have time to really just sit back and kind of grieve. I was grieving. Don't get me wrong. Can't stop it. But I couldn't, it was like, I was on this train, Yeah, this, this bullet train that was just going to forward. And, and in some respects, I, I didn't want to get off the train. It was just <laughs> exhilarating. I thought, well, what's going to happen today? You know, because there were all these amazing things happening and yeah. I was sharing the story and people were being inspired by it. And, and slowly people found our group who were like me, because initially there were people who were listening in our group who weren't having my experience. Okay. But the word got out and people started to come in saying, I'm having that contact too, yeah. or I want that contact too. So now it's predominantly those people. Right. So I'd like to ask, what was he sharing with you about his environment? This is something that people ask it, it, oh know. about the other side yeah like people say like what ha like What's what happens when you die like well, where do you go what does it look like who are you with and did he share any of those particulars with you like he what's didn't he doing? Didn't where is he who's he with well what I, what he didn't share all detail i mean he brought my my family who passed over he brought them to me to see and that was that happened a little bit later though but he wasn't talking to me about a lot about what he was doing over there. Although I found out later that, you know, he was actually visiting people and healing them. This is why I, I, I found out about that. I said, what the heck's going on? You know, people were telling me, these are people that were in my group that I weren't longtime clients. They just said, oh, I saw Alan. He came to me and healed me. And I said, what? <laughs> or, or, or a student of mine who said his wife who can see spirit woke up in the middle of the night and saw Alan there like, putting his hand over his stomach. This is my, my Reiki student's stomach, like giving him healing. And she, she, she looked at Alan. He looked at her because he didn't expect she'd see him, but she could. And she said, as soon as she saw him, he could see that she, she saw him, he smiled and then he disappeared, <laughs> disappeared. And so I was hearing stories like that. I thought, what is going on? Like this, I, I just didn't understand. Then the thing that really, taught showed me what he was doing was when a client asked us to help her 
uh, help heal a friend of hers that was in a coma. And this is in our book too. And he had been diagnosed with stage four cancer, leukemia, and he was in a coma. So she said, could, uh, could you and Alan, you know, send him healing? And Alan said, absolutely. Well, she'd asked us that. And then months later, he comes out of the coma and he, tell, he starts messaging her and he says that he sees this man, describes this man in a gray suit. I have a photo of Alan in a gray suit that this guy, he drew a picture of Alan, said he knew his name was Alan. He said that, that there was a woman with him that looked Japanese because this his friend, this woman, the client's Japanese. He said, looks like you, but her, her, I know her name is Pamela. I know she lives in Honolulu because I see a lay around her and I know she is a powerful healer. He was saying all these things. He says, I know her husband died in August and it was on his birthday. He was giving all this specific information about us. But what stunned me was that he saw me there and he said that I was the one that was healing him, but that Alan and I were together. So Alan was telling me that, that I go with him everywhere that I'm doing healing with him. So, that was mostly what he was showing me that, that I'm always with you, you're with me, and we're on the other side and here, but we're healing people in 3D world. And that, that thought, I mean, he, he says, he wasn't describing so much what he's, okay, he did, okay, he's telling me, he did show me the house he's building. And I understand that a lot of couples, especially their partners can, will say, yeah, I'm building a home for us. And this is what it looks like. And some people have had that experience of going there. So he showed me what that home looked like. And I've been there several times. And um, I'm having more direct contact with him through the veil because I'm learning how to kind of bilocate, like be here and be there. That's getting stronger with that. Um, so it's interesting what you said, because you said, I'm learning to bilocate, but you said that you're always together on the other side. So right. it's like from our like, linear mind perspective, we think we are here and then we are there. And right. from that perspective, we are in both places simultaneously. So we're dead and alive simultaneously. This is something I discussed with uh, a man called Dr. Leo Gallen. He called his book already here or already there because his son, who was on the other side, had said, but dad, you're already here. Like, right, you're, right. That, you're not here when you die. You're the here greater, all the, time. the greater, Right. The greater part of ourselves <laughs> remains in spirit. Yeah. Right. And expresses a portion into this body, but yeah. also is expressing a portion of itself in other realities. Right. Exactly. Right. So that's where we're multidimensional. Yeah. And I don't think all mediums understand that. Some of them do now. But yeah. they don't all understand that, well, we're multidimensional. Like when we're in a body, we're multidimensional. When we're not in a body, we're also multidimensional. Because Alan said that he could be with a million people at one time right. and always and also be with me. But he says, so can you? <laughs> we just yeah. don't remember. Exactly. Yet. But you're but, with me on the other side right now. Right. Why do you think you can connect? Right. Because you're already there. So if you just start, and all of us just start understanding that, and saying, this is the, the waking dream I'm having. When I go to sleep, I go back there. You know, that's the real world. This is like the illusionary world. And that's why it everything decays because it's temporary. It's not going to be forever. So, yeah. So but when you say of, you're learning to bilocate, what you To be mean, more conscious of it, to be, to be more, more aware, aware that, that be more, more aware, aware right? who I right. am as spirit right having this spiritual experience like being more aware like i'm physically aware of my body right mm -hmm. like right here i'm here in my body and yet be also aware that that i'm having this other experience right. with spirit or or maybe even aware that he's right here and i'm having this other level of experience simultaneously um, cause he says that that is possible that some people are already experiencing that. Mm -hmm. And because, because we're just are we're raising our consciousness. So more people can do that, you know, and that's evolution of our species to be able to do that more and more. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're getting there, you know, we can do that. Yeah. So it's quite fascinating. I think it's an amazing time to be having all this happen. 
I know it's amazing isn't to it? Isn't it? it all. Yeah. And to become aware of all this multifaceted yeah. aspects of who we are as spirit and soul and physical and spiritual all simultaneously. You know, I was having this conversation with a client yesterday. Uh, he was saying that he experienced some sleep paralysis and some missing time. And um, what the guides were saying is sleep paralysis is when you're um, a part of an aspect of your soul or, or that leaves at night is reconnecting to the body, but it's still outside the body, but it believes it's in the body. So it doesn't have control of the body. And so for a moment, your consciousness thinks I'm paralyzed because I have no control of the body. And then you fully integrate into the body and you've got control of the body. And I started to think about it in lieu to the conversation I was having with my other friend about her mother standing. I could see her standing outside the body while the body was fully animated and talking. And, you know, like, so there are these aspects of us that like all these different layers that can be together or separate depending on what right. we do. Yeah. Right, right. We have the physical body, we have the energy body, right? Right. And, and the both, etheric body and the right, right, body those, and the emotional body. Yeah, and the again, like we're so body. many different parts of ourselves, that multidimensionality part. Right, you know, right. that yeah. so it's it's fascinating that more of us are understanding that. And um that really nothing's nothing's impossible. Nothing you know, impossible. unless mm-hmm. if you if for someone who believes and isn't afraid, like, well, let me you know, I mean, that's how I opened up to this work. I, I just had this profound awakening. I, 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 all that happened was because I was channeling intensely for five months. Like nobody told me not to do that. <laughs> not a good idea. Channel for, you know, 45 minutes to, to an hour and a half every day for five months. I said, why? I love it. You know, I was so obsessed with it because channeling, it was channeling who Alan I was channeling my guys in the guides. very big, before right. I even met Alan, I was channeling my guys and I just felt so happy. You know, and nobody told me that, you know, if you tap into that joy of whatever you're doing and you keep doing it, doing it, your whole life is going to change because you're really tapping into who you really are and, and that who you really are is this unlimited being. So, so all these things started happening to me. People started telling me I was a witch and I was like, what are you talking about? I just channeling. I wasn't trying to get anything done. I wasn't trying to like, like make a living at it. I was, I just love to be in that state and connected with who I really am and connecting with my guidance. Right. So everything just overnight, I I got this message, you're dying. And I thought, okay, it's my time. I'll go. Like, I'm, I'm so happy. That's fine. This is a, if this is the time I'll, I'll leave. But of course I wasn't, it wasn't, you know, and, but, but my, this other part of me did go because I changed. So I realized later, years, years later, I realized somebody told me who had had three near deaths. He said, you had an NDE without dying. Now they call it a spiritually transformative experience. But back then, you know, it was just, he says, you had an NDE. He says, cause didn't you change dramatically? I said, yeah, I was uh, physically, I was healed physically of things. I had chronic allergies are really bad. They were gone. My voice changed and I was really confident all of a sudden where I'd been shy and insecure. So a lot of things just changed and I, I couldn't understand it. And he said, you had an NDE. And it can be triggered, he said, by something like that, like an intense meditation practice or in my case, channeling practice it can be ch- you know, triggered by a lot of things. So I feel like you had a walk-in experience. Another aspect of your soul uh, walked in to help you in this lifetime do what you do now. Yeah. Yeah. That's what was... I feel like. But I want to talk about your relationship with Alan because a lot of people who lose loved ones yes. feel like they've lost that love And that relationship with that love that they've physically focused on to another human being. And yet it continues and Mm -hmm. um, it always continues for everyone, but it's just that grief says I'm not aware of it. So with your grief, did your grief alleviate when, once you worked out the hiccups or the, you know, the, the problems, the personality problems that you and Alan had, once you'd worked that out and you reconnected to that relationship based in love, did that grief and that feeling of loss leave you? Yeah, it, the grief was, I would say nine months in, it was down to about maybe 80, 90% gone. There's always going to be a little, like a bittersweet sense to it, right? Like, cause your body misses their body, but I didn't have the deep grief for sure. That was like gone. Um, and because I kept talking to him, 
And he said, keep talking to me, right? And I tell people, write their messages, make them physical in this world by writing down what they're telling you. Or even like in my case, because I'm a channel and I teach channeling, say, speak their words, right? Like, like, cause you can, you can talk, speak for them. And I would do that. I would record it or and have it transcribed or whatever. And I would keep a record of that. And I would, he said, if you get upset, go back and read what you wrote. I'm talking to you or, or, or sit down right now and I'm going to and write me right now, like write down what I'm telling you. So that really made a big difference. So I tell my students to do that. You know, that's how you, he says, that's how you make the non-physical physical. Because if you just talk to us in your mind, which you can do, and I do that too, he said, that's fine. But, but if you want to bring it into this world and ground it into 3D reality and their words will have a certain energy to it even though it comes through you and you're writing it down, right? You're, you ask a question and they give you the answer. And I have, I have students in my, my group that have beautiful messages from their loved one on the other side. And one person was just shocked when she first started, did it, and, and he came through and she knew it wasn't her, like what he said was so evident that this is not him. This is not my way I express myself, right? So this is the way we can prove to ourselves, get our own confirmation that that's them. The other thing Alan was really big on and what we teach people is focus less on, on trying to see them. I mean, seeing them can come, but he said to me, he said, it's more important that you really feel my love because that's what's going to heal your grief. If you just see me, what does that do? You go, okay, I see you, but all I do is see you. You know, I'm not feeling anything. So he was really big on having me feel his presence, energetic presence, and feeling this overwhelming love, which I do feel. And I feel it like 24-7. So that just, just changed the whole thing for me. So we try to encourage people to just open up to feeling that love. and But you got to get through the grief, right? I mean, you can't. It's hard, I know, but but they so much want to to give us that love, and it's and it's a visceral thing. It's not like it's not like any love I've ever felt with anybody else before, even from him. It's on this whole other level, and that's what really, in the end, killed my grief. Does the love that you feel that you say is coming from him? Does it feel yeah. different from the love that you felt as his wife? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. So what's the difference? <laughs> because it's unconditional. And it, it's like this, it's hard to explain. It's like this steady sense that this presence, this loving presence, that even when he was here, even when we got along well, wasn't always like that because the ego would come in or his own issues would come in or, you know, whatever, right? Now it's like this steady, it's like feeling wrapped and bathed in this loving energy. Doesn't mean I don't have occasionally a bad day, you know, mm -hmm. or something, because that's what can happen, right? Like I get something in my head that I, I'm a little now off center, but if when I relax and at night, every time I feel him, like when I roll over to the side of the bed, I immediately feel his energy and I hear him say, okay, now we're together. And, and I, and I immediately, there've been times when I roll over that side of the bed, I immediately feel like turned on. I go, okay, I know you're in the mood tonight. Like, okay. And I'm not thinking of that. You know, I'm just like literally rolling over to that side of the bed. And to yeah. me, that's evidence that he's there. Yeah. But more than feeling like turned on, you know, there's this love. It's just so hard to explain to people who haven't experienced this. And I've had people, again, that I work with that say, you know what, as much as I grieve the loss of my, my partner, I must admit, like, I have access to him, like, all the time now. When he used to work all the time and he wasn't around, and now I feel him with me, I can talk to him, I, I feel loved. This is amazing. Yes, it's so sad that he's not physically here, but you know what? In some ways, this is better because I'm never alone. Yeah, exactly. And Esther, he's communicating Hicks, with me. Esther Hicks said the same about Jerry. About Hicks. Jerry? Yeah. yeah. You know, when, because what I found interesting is that as, as the channel for Abraham, she would say repeatedly, you humans just got to get over this death thing. There is no death. You got to get over it. And then she experienced it for herself. And she went straight into that same earthly grieving experience and couldn't work. Have to. 
Yeah. I don't know if you have to. I didn't. I, I didn't. think I think a lot of people do. It, it depends. But yeah, I mean, once you once you understand, or maybe even visual... she maybe even she had to to teach from that experience. Yeah, maybe she to did. show people to show people this is the way through it. You know. <clears throat> but what what she said after she got over the grief and her and Jerry, um, uh, you know, formed that same relationship that that you and Alan have is that it is a far more intimate relationship and loving relationship that they ever had as two physically focused yes. humans. And because she I'm getting felt, goosebumps. I'm getting yeah, goosebumps. She felt him, you know, over there in his physical clump, as she calls it. And <laughs> um and then she was here in her physical clump. But as as the partnership, he flows through her like he would edit the videos or the DVDs or the MP3s of the classes. And she didn't like it or didn't know how to do it. So he just blows through her physical body and edits through her. And so they're one in their physical body. And yeah. that intimacy, she said, she could have never experienced while he was still physically focused in his physical clump. She talks about it. And I and I love that because that That's, intimacy that is too. everything that we're wanting from a physical relationship with another, right? And, you know, there's that scene in the movie Cocoon about sex. Yeah. Because I've right. heard people talk about having sex with spirit. Cosmic sex. Cosmic sex. <laughs> and and there's that that scene in the movie Cocoon where there's the alien and he's hot for the alien because she's wearing this, yeah. I think it was Raquel Welsh's daughter. Yeah, yeah wearing right. wearing hot physical body and, and this human guy is all hot for her and he wants to have <laughs> sex with her and she says, get to the other end of the pool because they're in the pool and she throws her energy at him. At him, right. And it then just... he has this orgasmic experience. So she he has this non-physical sex <laughs> and I'm like, same deal, right, with the spirit. You can have that. Well, you can. I, I I have had that. I know people who've had that non-physical <laughs> sex, somebody in my group for her husband gave her an orgasm like right. this. It was so funny because she said she saw me and Alan like above her because, like, you know, she's in our group, saw my face and Alan's face. And then she heard the words, this is really happening. This is really happening. All of a sudden there was this like whoosh. <laughs> she just said, <laughs> and I said, whoa, your husband gave you a spontaneous orgasm. That can happen. Yeah. Like not happen every day, obviously, but, but it's amazing. You know, in Garnet Schulhauser, have you heard of Garnet Schulhauser? So he's no. a conservative corporate lawyer who now writes books from his spirit guide's perspective, takes him around the cosmos and shows him all this thing. He was shown um, how spirits have sex on the other side. And what was really interesting, so Garnet, as this physical, physically focused human, very conservative, you know, he was conservative, married, Catholic lawyer, yeah. And um, and now he's not as conservative as you could imagine. <laughs> but it's right. been over 10 years since he's been writing his books with his spirit guide. But he was presented with a physically male-looking soul who appeared to him as, as a man. And he said, We're gonna, I'm going to show you how we have sex on this. And they said he just merged his energy with this soul. And then as they merged their energy, they had this orgasmic experience and then they came apart like that. So, And I said, isn't it interesting that as a straight man here on earth, Garnet presented you with another soulmate, but in a, in a male form and not in a female form? <laughs> I thought, I wonder why he did that, just sort of mixing it up a bit. That's interesting. Breaking but is, isn't gen, that a great but norm. isn't that a great lesson just just say love is love love like, is love what yeah. does it matter You're love right. is love whoever mm -hmm. yeah so, that's beautiful yeah so it's fascinating so all this is possible we can maintain all relationships that is with possible. our loved ones maintain a sexual relationship with all that is possible ones. Like I'm hearing people who are having that contact of people in my group who are saying they ask their partner to kiss them and they feel their lips like tingle, um, all kinds of things. Okay. Alan says, he kept saying to me, the other side's getting stronger. You know, the more people who are open to the experiences, as you know, that helps other people have more experiences because we're all connected, aren't we? So mm -hmm. as more of us say, okay, I'm, I'm up for this. It just becomes easier for other people. Exactly. It becomes more of a critical mass sort of yeah. experience. The more people experiencing it, the more available it becomes to the, the collective. Right. But you talk about the love. When I asked you about the love, how is it different? You said it's more unconditional. It's so, very, and it's so very intimate. It's interesting sure. that 
that you're saying that he's giving you that love, but I feel like he is showing you the love that you are. It's like, oh, it's yes, not, yes. It's not no, that too. his that too. love for you. It's who we are as love because you hear this from near death experiences who say, I experienced a love on the other side, like I've never experienced on earth. So, you know, we have these yeah. intimate relationships with people expecting to experience that love and rarely do we experience it. I think for the first yeah. time I experienced unconditional love when I gave birth. And um, I've got this baby who's keeping me up all night and vomiting in my ear and pooing everywhere. And I'm still loving her. And I'm thinking, okay, so this is what unconditional love is like, because relationship is very conditional. Like you upset me. So I'm not loving you in this moment, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> you right. don't do that with a baby. Another question I want to ask you is he had a family he, before you, he was married before you, wasn't he? Yes. And you had a, a son together? Yes. We, we got together and he had made me promise because he didn't want to have another family because he, the, the marriage wasn't really happy, at least at the end, you know, and he, he didn't, he'd worked so hard all his life. He, he'd grown up in poverty and made, as, as often happens, right, with somebody who's had a hard time, they, they go on to great, great success because they just launching that, that desire for it, right? So he'd done all that, worked hard all his life raised two sons who are now adults and was had gotten divorced a few years before he met me. And when he met me, he says, you know, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have any more children. Is that okay with you? And I said, that's fine. And I said, if I happen to get pregnant, okay, I guess I get an abortion. I don't have any belief against it. You know, I know the soul doesn't die, that kind of thing. But then when I got pregnant, you know, I felt like I had to have the baby. And that was my intuition as you know, that would happen, right? Like I, I honestly meant what I told him at the time because I had no inclination of being a mother. I never had that on my radar at all. You know, I just wasn't something I ever thought about. So I thought, well, okay, if I got pregnant, I'd get an abortion. That all changed. I knew I was supposed to have this baby. If I don't have this baby, I regret it for the rest of my life. Even if I lose him, I'm, I'm going to have to do it. And he was so upset so upset. He thought I was manipulating him. And I said, I'm not, if you don't want to be with me, that's okay. Not okay, but you know, I'm going to accept it because I need to do this. And so he accepted it because he said he didn't have a choice. He loved me. He loved me. He didn't want to lose me, but, but we had a son and, and of course, later he realized that was the greatest blessing because he got to have another life, another family, like a second chance. And when he crafted returned to me from his side, he said, thank you so much for giving me a second chance at life and love because, you know, I didn't know what it was really like to be a father. I was a dare there. I wasn't really there for my sons. You know, I was caught up in my work. And, um, and so this was different. But what I want to know is how does his so he had two sons from his first wife and mm -hmm. one son from him. how did the children feel about the book and your relationship and you continue oh, his contact his sons from his first marriage they don't really he they never i don't think they ever really accepted what he did like when he changed transitioned to doing psychic work okay they were they kind of tolerated that uh -huh. and and i think now he told me later that was why he didn't when we got married decided to get married he didn't want to move back to england mm -hmm. because he couldn't see me living there plus his his sons you know his family didn't really accept it mm -hmm. so and my family did mm -hmm. like my my parents my my grandmother was a psychic medium i didn't know that until i opened up and so my parents were completely okay with what i was doing and my whole life was here so so they don't i don't even know i think they know the book came out but i haven't really talked to them about it his his ex-wife is actually really supportive more than his sons because she says that she even though she doesn't understand what we do she knows some people that i guess have had gone to mediums or or or, or, or open to it so she's a little more accepting like i don't understand it myself personally but i know other people do so i'm okay with this but his sons you know not so much <laughs> so it's okay and what about your son how old is he now He's 31 and he's quite psychic. He, wow. I, I don't, um, how can I put it? I, I know that he's, he's hearing Alan more now. 
he took him a while because he was grieving and he didn't really want to process that right away. But Alan appeared to him in a dream and told him to cry. And my son started crying in the dream and they woke mm-hmm. up. He said, okay, dad made me cry. And now he says that he will, he, his dad will come through at times and just, just tell him something without him asking and, or he'll reach out to him. And I say, well, how do you know that that's your dad that when, when you're doing that? He says, well, mom, first of all, he speaks in a way that I don't speak. And he gives me advice that sometimes I don't even know if I want to take, but he's right. (laughs) (laughs) Like I go, really? Okay, but he's right. He's always right. And I said, that's funny. He says, oh, yeah, I hear. And my son, our son is very psychic. Um, Just things that I've seen him do. And Alan says that he will see him and more clearly probably than I will, but that, that we're actually what we're doing right now is actually for him. I just don't even know what that means, but Alan mm-hmm. says we are creating something that Taylor is going to step into because this is his purpose. Yeah, he is. Oh, I just saw that. Oh, I just saw that timeline. Huge. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I'd love, I'd love your insight on that because I've had other psychics from when he was wow. little tell me things like mm-hmm. you do know your son's really special. And I would say, well, every parent thinks their child's special, right? So I'm not going to automatically oh, go, now? oh yeah, my son is special. 31. You know, but- He's 31 now. He's 31. He's 31. I mean, just my daughter. And, um, but he's not ready for it yet. He's not up for it yet. No, 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 no. He's not ready for it yet, but Mm -hmm. he's open. He's getting, he's open to all this. He knows what we do. He's totally open to it. Mm -hmm. He calls on, he's called on his dad for healing for, for his pets when they're sick or other people and they all get healed. They all get helped. He knows his dad is with him and can help him. But I think that, and I just have had people tell me that he's got abilities that I'll be blown away by, you know, that yeah. that's why he's our son. That, yeah. And that's why I had to have him. So yeah. I had to have him because not because he's going to have an ordinary life, you know, just yeah, not, that there's a, not there's anything wrong with it, but a soul agreement. Absolutely. Yeah. In place. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I knew that so, as soon as I got but- pregnant. Before we go, I'd yes. love for you to just because we've been yakking for ages, but we could talk for it. <laughs> we could talk all that. Uh, I'd love you to sort of share some of the profound things that Alan said to you know to you from the other side uh, about I don't know about anything that you know knocked your socks off like some of the things that he shared with you. I mean, when you know that it's not the personality ego. Uh, speaking when you know that it's like the God aspect or the higher self aspect speaking uh, through Alan as Alan. Okay. One of the things that he said in the book was well, the first thing that just blew my mind. I said, how can that be? Is he said, he says, well, I'm an archangel and so are you. And I go, what, how the heck can that be? What are you talking about? Okay. I understand about incarnated angels or you know the incarnated fairies or what are you talking about archangels he said and then my friend swati who can who can talk to him too and see him she echoed the same thing later he said because archangel is more of a job description than than actually you know this this elevated being okay it, it's a job and I go, okay. And he says, so your job, you, you have always been interested in helping people embody their soul. You were always into that. I said, right. I was more into that than him. He was more interested in the psychic, right? All that realm. I was more about spirituality. He would, he would have always said, yeah, I'm not that into spirituality, (laughs) but I was less so about the psychic, although the two obviously overlap. Yeah. But um, he said, so you're, you and I are here to help people become more in touch with their soul to awaken to their soul. And he says, and we've always done that as twin souls. And he said on, this is not our first try at coming together to help, to help people open up spiritually because we've always done that. But this time there's a lot on the line because of the Ascension. And Mm -hmm. I had to go because I could have more power on the other side than if I was in a body. Right. Because, and you help anchor my energy into this world so that I can have more effect and, and help people than if you were with me on the other side, right? Because you need a conduit, you need a human conduit. Then he reminded me, and again, this is in my book of this, this 
kind of vision that I had in the early days of my awakening, when I had just put my head on the pillow to take a nap, I wasn't asleep at all. I just put my head down and I was shown that I was thrown into this vision of me standing before a group of people about six or so of them. And I'm standing there talking to them, looked like I was teaching them, which I wasn't doing at the time. And I all of a sudden felt myself pull through my body, like up through a tube, like go up above me. And as I was going through this tube or tunnel, whatever you want to call it, I could feel this other being pass me in the tunnel, right? This tube and go into my body. And so I was up there looking down, but I was also in my body looking at the people and I could feel this presence with me. And then I saw myself walk like from both places, which tripped me out. I saw myself walking up to these people and touching them on the third eye, which I don't even know if I knew what a third eye was, to be honest with you at the time, because I was so brand new to this, touching them on their third eye and they would fall backwards. They would just go pass out and fall backwards. I knew they were fine. They, they were blissed out, but it just freaked me out because it was so dramatic and unexpected. And I, I was like, what the hell is this going on? I didn't feel uncomfortable with the being that had come in, I was just more like, what is this about? So when I came out of it, I called up this psychic that I had recently met, who was amazing psychic. And she said, well, let me check. And she goes, oh, well, your guides are just showing you what you came here to do. And I said, what? I don't want to do that. Are you crazy? What the hell was that? And she says, well, it's, they're just letting you know, this is what you will do or can do, but it's up to you. You know, it's up to you. And I said, I don't have anything to do with that. Like, that's just too weird. You know, again, this was the early days. So at the end of the book, I write how Alan said to me, you remember that vision you had? You said, you're going to activate that. You, you are an awakener, like many other people, like many, many other people, right? We are doing that. We're doing that. But, but you are the one that's really, you know, stepping into that. Uh, but I'm behind you. He says, you, you need to do this alone, but yet not alone. You know what I mean? Like nobody's alone, really. But you're going to do this. And I said, OK, if I'm here for that, OK, I'm ready now. I wasn't ready 30 some odd years ago, but I'm ready now. So those things started to happen, you know, like those activations and things started to happen. And so that just blew my mind. I said, what are you talking about, Archangel? <laughs> And my friend Spotty says, yes, Pam, Archangel is a job description. And we are everything. All of us are everything. We're an elemental. We're a fairy. We're a rock. We're an angel. We're everything because we're all God. We're both the oneness that is God and the aspect of, that is God. We're all of it, right? Like both sides of, of all of it. So I said, all right, I guess, I guess that's true then because this is what's happening. He's showing up healing people in hospitals, wearing this gray suit that I have a picture of. And I go, why are you wearing a gray suit? He says, because I want people who can see me clairvoyantly to know to take me seriously. So I'm wearing a gray suit. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, that makes sense. Because he'd be in a hospital, he's wearing a gray suit with a tie and everything. I just cracked up because I'd have people tell me they saw him and they didn't okay. know about the gray suit thing. Yeah, they just said. Yeah. Just did he it. wear did he wear gray suits when he was he probably didn't he probably in England. Didn't. In England he did. Oh, when he was in England. When, it, but, when he was working as a as a Oh, not not here. He never wore suits casual. once he moved to yeah, away. Yeah, and yeah. and before we do go, I want to tell you, in our book, there's a there's a medium who lives in Sydney who actually heard about us and she, and I just want to say, cause you're in Sydney, she called out to us because she had, her niece had given birth to a baby who was struggling, was really sick and they were afraid wasn't going to make it. She heard about us. She had asked the angels to give her help. And she knew when she heard about us that we were, could help. So she called, she called us out, out to us saying, Kevin Allen Johnson, Pamela Allen Johnson, I need your help. And almost immediately Alan appeared in the backseat of her car wearing a gray suit <laughs> <laughs> he's in his gray suit again <laughs> yeah and she told me i said oh my god was it a gray suit she goes yeah and i showed her that sent her the picture she goes yeah that suit so it's just been mind-blowing but but she was an amazing medium and she like the angels would tell stop her it was she'd be in the market they'd stop her and say you need to talk to that woman <laughs> like she couldn't yeah. move until you know what i mean like she had to go give that person a message yeah. that's how she would work I, I know you know how that can be. And so that was just Absolutely. amazing. What was More her, confirmation. What, what, is, what is her name? 
Well, I, I'm not really going to, I can give you her name okay. privately, but, okay, but she, okay. didn't, she didn't want to, you know, be, I changed her name in our book because she, she actually, the name she, she uses is not even her family name, but, but she's having you know issues with her family. Yeah. So she didn't. And then her niece didn't want people to know what happened. So we changed his name too. Yeah. Just, just to keep it, you know, yeah. comfortable years- for her. In years to come, this whole psychic phenomena will be so much more mainstream and people will cease hiding and changing names and all that sort of stuff. You know, it'll be, and and you're all a part of, and me, of making it more all of mainstream. Us, all of us are doing it, aren't we? Right. You Just know, even I was watching a, some sort of streaming show the other day and they were looking for a lost dog. And they um, were in the woods with this Mexican, young Mexican girl. And she said, oh, my mother was a gypsy. I have the gift. I have the gift. And and people were all poo-pooing it like, oh, you know, like scoffing at it. And I'm watching this movie because it's not that old, the movie. And I'm thinking, is that still happening? Do people still places, scoff at this they're, they're, stuff? You know, it just it amazes it. me because there's so much of it. But anyway, and your son is a big part of that too i'll tell you about what i saw but pam it's been so beautiful to speak with you today oh it was so lovely to to connect with you and i hope you come to hawaii sometime soon so we can meet you oh that would be gorgeous person yeah i'd love to come back to i've been back to i think i was 95 the last time i was in maui a long time ago maui i was i did an anthony robbins in maui when in 95 was the last time but yeah i think before that was when i was 19 so that was a long time ago but it's a beautiful beautiful place i'd love to go back one day swim with the whales and the dolphins and oh you can swim with the dolphins on uh on hawaii the big island yeah go to the big island that's the best place to swim with them such a big island place thank you so much for being thank you thank you so much so pleased to connect and be with you and and so yeah so grateful how wonderful to meet pam today and hear her story just loved it. Just loved that story. We had a great chat afterwards. I was giving her a psychic reading about her son and uh, she was telling me some things. She said she was on another podcast show that disappeared. The the whole thing came down. um, I thought she'd been on many other podcast shows actually. And she said, no, you're the second one. I'm like, oh, well, that's nice. But yeah, it's a great story. Love across the veil. Continuing the love story. Wonderful. So much to talk about. Yeah, we could talk for ages. I actually invited her into the inner sanctum, maybe next year, maybe towards the end of the year to continue the story of psychic ability and talking to loved ones across the veil. You know, this this idea that you have to be special or different or a psychic and that you're not a psychic. Oh, I poo-poo all that. I think all of us are, ty- are psychic. We're all psychic. We're all natural psychics. We just don't rely on that ability. And so it atrophies, you know, we lose the ability, but it's sitting there waiting for us to pick it up and use it and there's never more use for it than when someone we know and love has transitioned to the other side but as I said I had my girlfriend here the other day she was talking about her mother's transitioning and and her ex-partner had transitioned not long ago and he came in and she says you know that she hasn't got access to him but she does and he says she does but she's got this belief that she's not psychic or that she can't do that and your beliefs create your reality so if you believe you can you will and if you believe you can't you won't you get to create all of it my guides remind me on (laughs) at nauseam a day-to-day moment-to-moment basis you are the creator of your reality so if you believe something you will create that experience yep that's how it works including psychic ability It is natural to all of us. In fact, we're all born utilizing that psychic ability. We're communicating telepathically with our mothers and everyone around us as a baby until the physical, uh, you know, communication kicks in. What? How old are you when you start talking? Two, three, two, and you start communicating verbally, but we're communicating telepathically uh, when we're babies. And of course, often children retain a strong connection to their psychic ability to the age of four or five or six or seven, sometimes up to 10, and then rely more on the communication through physical ways of speaking and, uh, and they can lose it and some people retain it. But uh, we are all natural psychics, all of us, psychic mediums. Pam and I were talking about, I said that I started radio with a psychic 
who called it, whose name was Pam, and she could do things that I couldn't do because she could get all these details, like about what people's houses look like, and she got all this visual detail. And I said, I don't have that visual detail. And my guide said to me, but that's not your work. You know, it depends on what you're utilizing the ability for. But my work was more to teach, and so I could directly contact my mob or spirit guides or the stream of consciousness that teaches all the teachers I could contact that and bring through those messages that was more my work whereas her work at the time was being more the psychic and um, yeah it depends on your desire and intention and how you're going to utilize the connection what you want to do with it it creates it becomes stronger depending on what you want to do with it and the agreement that you have as a soul how you're going to use it in this lifetime yeah the guides are saying that um, all of us are going to find that we're all becoming more psychic and that synchronicity of knowing things and knowing when someone's going to call you. I was just thinking about you and bumping into them. All those synchronicities are becoming more accelerated as we all tune in and remember our psychic ability. Cool, huh? Who's coming up into the inner sanctum next week? I think it's next week, 20th, 21st on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday in the Northern Hemisphere, Sunday morning, in the Southern Hemisphere is Kevin Briggs. Talking about psychic ability, Kevin is somebody, yeah, it's Sunday the 21st here in Australia on Saturday the 20th in the Northern Hemisphere. Kevin, he's an ET walking on earth. Kevin is somebody that's had these abilities as a child and utilized them. I love his story. He's been on the show several times. And in the inner sanctum, he's coming back because I just love him. He's just adorable. He's the happiest person I know. He said he was a teenager before he realized that he'd never had a negative thought because, you know, teenagers start to complain and whine about things. And he was listening to all his friends complain and whine. And he was thinking, I've never felt like that. I've never had a thought like that. And then he thought, maybe there's something wrong with me. (laughs) You should be a bit more unhappy. But he said that his guides contacted him when he was about eight or nine in the bath forget the details, nine, maybe eight, maybe nine. And then he had an energy orb um, cruising in a room one day. He could see it and then hanging behind a curtain in a room. Anyway, I'll get him to repeat the story, uh, even though I've heard it many times. And he said after the experience with the energy orb, he said it was orange. He had the ability to astral travel at will consciously. So he would do things like and project his consciousness go to the end of his, um, to the gate of his house and there were two bus stops that he could go to to school and he would just project his consciousness and go and have a look, which is the busier bus stop. I won't go to that one. I'll go to the one with less people. He'd just check out the bus stops and he said things like he'd be on the bus and he'd be kind of bored going on the bus to school and he'd just pop out of his body and fly behind the bus, (laughs) just do all this stuff as a kid. And uh, he was in contact with his guides, ET guides, a group of them. Uh, for his whole life, and it wasn't until about five or six years ago that the guide said to him, okay, now we want you to tell people about your experience. But he would have gone to his grave and never told anyone except for his, you know, his wife and his brother and a couple of close friends because, he, you know, he understood that people just don't understand this stuff. And, of course, a few years ago the guide said, the world is waking up, share your experience. So the gorgeous Kevin's coming in to the inner sanctum. Oh, I just love Kevin. If you do want to check out your psychic ability, you could do it with private sessions. I can show you just how amazing you all are. Every time I do it with people privately or in the courses, people are always amazed at how they can do it so easily. It's only a thought that you can't do it. Once you get rid of that thought, yeah, you're off and away. How do you want to utilize it though? Do you want to talk to spirit? Do you want to channel books? Do you want to speak to your dead loved ones? Do you want to have personal guidance for yourself? Do you want to give guidance to others? Do you want to teach people? There's so many ways you can utilize your connection to your soul, your higher self, your guides, your psychic ability. Think about it and uh, let me know and I'll, I'll get you activated. Accelerate, activate, acclimate and accentuate the new world teachers is what I've got on my website. So I look forward, if you're going to pop into the Inner Sanctum, if you want to join up, just go to karenswain.com slash Inner Sanctum and put your email in there and I'll send you the Zoom link. If you want to join us on Zoom with Kevin, 
love you to join us. I love it when people ask a lot of questions. You know me, I'm full of questions, but I love it when other people ask questions. And we'll be streaming some of it live too. Uh, I usually do the q and I stream about an hour of Kevin chatting and telling his stories, take a couple of questions and do a bigger Q&A um, off live. So just for the people who come on Zoom. It is free or by donation. I do appreciate your donations because I do put a lot of stuff out there free. So I really appreciate your donations. A few people have been making some lovely donations lately. So I thank you to those people who've sent in a couple of hundred dollars. That was very generous of you. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time round. And thank you all for sharing the shows and watching and listening and leaving a comment. Press that subscribe button, you know, all that sort of stuff. Love you big time. Remember to check out the book Awakened by Death if you haven't already. See you soon. Bye for now.